Hi everyone. I'd like to introduce uh, Tom. He's a physicist and software engineer who has been passionately using Haskell 13 years. He has worked in uh, Haskell projects in a variety of domains. Uh, today, he's worked us through uh, strict Haskell. Over to you, Tom. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening as the case may be. Um, very appropriately today, I'm in the happiness track because I'm going to uh, share something with you that has made me a much happier Haskell programmer. So my objective for today is to teach you how evaluation in Haskell works and how to control it. We'll talk also about measuring performance because um, we're gonna need to measure things so we can control them. And I'll tell you about my experience, what brought me to strict Haskell and um, why I think you should and shouldn't use it. First, let's look at how evaluation happens. Um, I've got a series of examples here um, and I'm gonna use trace uh, to show how things get evaluated. So uh, trace prints a message before its second argument is evaluated. So I've just set up some definitions here. Um, and each of these will first, when, when this is evaluated, it will, will print the string and then just return whatever the other argument is. So I can set up some simple data type and a simple new type here. Um, and I've got this uh, already loaded into GHCI. So if I just, um, if I just evaluate this example, GHCI will, will print using show, and this will show me the order that things are evaluated in. So first, uh, of course, when we go to print this, um, the first thing I see is outside. So we're gonna print that. Um, then, then the show instance is gonna take over and it's gonna start by printing the constructor. Uh, and then finally, it's gonna print the argument of the constructor. And notice that the argument here uh, inside doesn't get printed until we've already printed the constructor. So we don't actually evaluate the argument here until we're getting ready to print it. Classic laziness, all right? So if you take away nothing else from my talk, I want you to take away this. The essence of evaluation in Haskell is pattern matching. That's it. The runtime evaluates your expression until it can decide if something matches. So in this example here, we're gonna see that, um, the, again, the argument of the constructor is not going to be evaluated. We can walk through this step-by-step. Step. Um, first up, I've got the expression from the, from the case, and I've got a pattern, and I wanna know, does it match? I don't know. I can't tell if that matches. So I evaluate a step. That's gonna, that means I'm gonna evaluate outside. That prints outside, and we take another step. Then I've uh, got uh, a constructor and some argument as my expression. Check the pattern again. Does it match? Yes, it matches. All right, I'm done. And no more evaluation, All right? Here's another example. Um, we can, uh, also match on the argument of the constructor. And if I try this, um, you can see that uh, here I'm gonna get both, both of these tracers will be evaluated. And it's easy to see why, just going step-by-step step like before. Um, first initial expression from the case, uh, try to match the pattern, I can't tell. So I evaluate outside. Um, Still can't tell if it matches that, that pattern. So I need to evaluate inside. Um, still can't tell, I've got this, adi this addition problem. So we evaluate that. And finally, no, it doesn't match. So we're done. So that's what I want you to take away from this. We evaluate until we can tell if a pattern matches or, or not. Uh, every other technique for controlling evaluation is gonna build on this or modify this somehow. First modification, um, we have irrefutable patterns. Um, 
So an irrefutable pattern defers evaluation. So it's lazier. It defers evaluation until we need one of the variables bound in the pattern. So if I go ahead and look at this ordinary refutable pattern, um, let me see what happens. Uh, I print the outside here um, because I have to do this pattern match. And then I'm not going to evaluate the, the inside of the constructor until I'm actually on the right-hand side of this expression. And it's easy to see why I don't actually need A until I'm already over here. So that's why we see outside, right-hand side, inside. If I use an irrefutable pattern match instead, you can see that nothing at all gets evaluated until I'm already on the right-hand side. So I've delayed evaluating this expression. There's a catch. Irrefutable patterns always match, all right? So if you write an irrefutable pattern that doesn't actually always match, you can get exceptions at runtime like this. Okay. Obviously this pattern doesn't match, but GHC is not gonna give me a warning about this, this case being inexhaustive because it is exhaustive because this pattern is irrefutable. Another key thing about laziness is that the results of evaluation are shared. So here I have a value, it's gonna print shared when I evaluate this. So if I evaluate it once by pattern matching, see, prints shared, um, right here. If I evaluate again, I don't get another, uh, I don't get another trace because I've already evaluated. So the results are, are shared. So this all works really well if we know the constructors for a type. Um, we can evaluate any expression we want. So what do we do if we don't know the constructors? Like maybe the constructors aren't in scope or maybe our function is polymorphic and we don't actually know the concrete type. So seek is a function in base that helps us out here. It evaluates its first argument and returns the second. So in this example, we're going to see um, we're going to see both of these traces fire, right? So even though this argument never appears anywhere in our result, it's never actually pattern matched on. This trace is still printed, and that's because in order to in order to execute this pattern match. First, we, get, we have to pass through seek. Seek evaluates its first argument to weak head normal form. That means that a, a term that is either a constructor at the top or a lambda. So here are some examples of pattern or of expressions in weak head normal form. A constructor applied to anything, uh, a lambda, or um, literals like primitive types like integers, characters, that sort of thing. Here's some things that are not in weak head normal form. Uh, a new type constructor applied to anything. New type constructors are not real constructors. Remember, they don't exist at runtime. So in order for this term to be in, um, in weak head normal form, its argument also has to be in weak head normal form. Um, we also have here just different take, diff these are all different kinds of functions, right? If is a function, function composition is a function, addition is a function. These all have functions at the top, so they're not in weak head normal form. A term that's not in weak head normal form, we call a thunk. Um, a thunk can be bottom or an, an exception. Um, but if a term is in weak head normal form, then we know it's not bottom because there's a constructor or a lambda at top. It's, it, those aren't bottom. In the documentation of seek, this is what it says. It says the value of seek AB is bottom if A is bottom and otherwise it's B. So that kind of explains um, the whole evaluate to weak head normal form thing. Seek is going to evaluate A just as far as necessary to see if A is bottom. And once it's, once it's figured out that A is not bottom, it's gonna go on and, and return B. Um, 
So from here on in my, in my talk, if I say evaluate, I mean evaluate to weak head normal form. That's just kind of a mouthful and I don't wanna repeat myself every time. So after that, um, that's all just basic Haskell. Um, let's talk about extensions. So bang patterns is an extension that's been around for quite a while, um, almost, almost as long as I've been using Haskell. And what this lets us do with this extension on, we can put an exclamation point or a bang in a pattern. And that pattern will be evaluated, um, again, to weak head normal form before matching. So in this example, even though X is never actually used, uh, never actually appears in the result, it still gets evaluated to weak head normal form, which evaluates that tracer. This is exactly the same thing as would happen if I inserted seek. This is really just syntax sugar for seek. Um, but it's really nice syntax sugar. And I think for that reason, you tend to see bang patterns be used uh, a little more often than inserting uh, seek by hand. Like I said, it's been around for a long time. So you really don't have any um, compatibility concerns here. You can put the exclamation point anywhere in a pattern. Um, it's basically just a, a prefix operator, but sometimes it has no effect. For example, in this pattern, um, it has no effect here. And that's because this pattern already forces the expression into weak head normal form because there's a constructor at the top. So since this is only going to evaluate as far as weak head normal form, it doesn't do anything additional, but it's perfectly legal to put here. The behavior inside let and where blocks is also a little bit subtle. So I wanna call uh, attention to that. But once you've used this once or, once or twice, it's, I think it's very natural what happens here. So whenever you have a bang at the top of a pattern, that pattern will be evaluated before, the, before we start the body of the let or where block. So that looks like this. You can see we have outside before body. If you have a nested bang pattern on the other hand, it's inside some other pattern, that's not going to be evaluated until some variable in that pattern is used. Show that here. Um, this bang is nested inside the tuple. And we see that first we enter the body right here. And we don't evaluate Y or print inside until we actually need X, but it happens before we need X. So notice it doesn't happen when we need Y. It happens when we need any variable here. Another thing that will um, get you, this has to do again with new types and weak head normal form. Um, and this applies to bang patterns and to C. Um, remember new type constructors are not real constructors. So if I put the bang here, even though it looks like it doesn't do anything, because I have a constructor here, it's a new, new type constructor. So I actually have to evaluate both of these. All right, so that's how we can kind of control um, patterns. Um, we can also control evaluation of constructor fields. This isn't an extension, it's in the Haskell 2010 report. I actually wasn't sure about that. I had to go double check, but it's, it's there. Um, you can make a field strict by giving the bang prefix to its type. And this works with anonymous fields and also with named fields like records. So here's a strict data type, um, just a single strict field. Strict fields are evaluated when the constructor is evaluated. So if I take a lazy pattern match, remind ourselves here, um, the, this field is not evaluated because it's not required for the match. On the other hand, the strict field is going to be evaluated whenever we uh, evaluate the constructor term to what we can normal form. So lazy, we don't evaluate this strict field. You see the trace goes off. So strict fields are really commonly used and a lot of people think they're really great and I think they're really great. Um, but there is a catch that I think people don't um, appreciate very well. That is, 
you can only lazily bind a field, a strict field, with an irrefutable pattern match. So you need to be careful because there's some, we talked about there's issues with pattern matching on some types. You can get exceptions at runtime. So think carefully if you add a strict field to a sum type. You can do it, it's fine, just be aware of what you're doing. So if we like strict fields so much, we can just make all constructor fields strict by default with the strict data extension, which has been available since GHC 8.0.1. If I have strict data enabled, that's just the same as making all of the, all of the fields strict. So if I wrote this in a, in a module with strict data, um, that's what it would look like. By the way, this only applies to the modules where you turn it on. So uh, you don't have to worry about messing up someone else's module. We can still make fields lazy just by using a tilde here. Um, and so you might notice here there's kind of a uh, there's kind of a pattern in the in the syntax. Bang tends to make things more strict and tilde tends to make things lazier. Um, strict data is a really popular extension. And a lot of people think it's like totally harmless. Uh, but as I pointed out, there are some issues with strict fields. Uh, you're kind of forced to be always strict. So be aware of that consequence if you're going to use this extension. Uh, the last extension I want to talk about and kind of the, um, the culmination of, of my talk here is the strict extension. This was added at the same time as strict data. It turns on strict data and it also makes patterns strict by default by adding an implicit uh, bang. So it's built on top of bang patterns. So you'll see this in function definitions. Um, we get implicit, implicit bangs here, 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 so on. Again, just like strict data, this only applies to the module where you turn it on. So a lot of people have this misconception, I think, that this is going to like totally rewrite the semantics of Haskell turning on strict, or that it's going to, I don't know, um, like it's going to interfere with, with functions in the prelude that rely on laziness, but that couldn't be further from the truth. It's only going to modify the module where we turn it on, and it's just going to add bang patterns by default. It doesn't even apply any nested bang patterns, just at the top level. So frequently, it doesn't actually do anything at all. Um, it also doesn't add them at, at top-level module bindings. I didn't mention this with bang patterns, but you can't actually put bang patterns at the top level of a module because um, like it doesn't make sense as far as like, you know, when, when you add the bang, you're saying this pattern will be evaluated before something. But if you're at the top level of a module, it's not clear what, what you're being before. Um, so you can't use them there anyway. Uh, because it now strict does turn on strict data by default. So, you know, the usual caveats about that apply, but you can also turn it off by hand. That's an option. Um, you can also suppress the implicit bang with the tilde. Uh, that does mean that if you want to write an irrefutable pattern, like, like so, um, you need two tildes and you actually need the parentheses to make it work out right. Um, so this is kind of ugly, but um, I think I can count on one hand the number of times I've actually seen an irrefutable pattern match used in, in practice. So, you know, this maybe doesn't bother us so much. And like I said, strict only applies in the module where you turn it on. So you don't have to worry that you're going to suddenly break someone else's code, right? It only applies to the code that you're writing. Um, and basically the effect of putting all of these bangs here is you don't get to pattern match on something, even a wild card match, until you know it's defined. That's it. That's basically the effect. So I've walked you through all of the um, techniques we have for controlling evaluation. I want to talk about profiling now. And this is really important because if we're going to control something, we need to be able to measure it. 
Why? Well, we talked about thunks and weak head normal form. Every time we make a thunk, that's a trade-off. The trade-off is we spend less time doing evaluation. Making a thunk is really cheap. A thunk is just a bunch of pointers in memory. We just stick the pointers in memory somewhere on the heap. Um, very cheap to make them. But frequently, it uses more memory to hold the thunk than it would if we evaluated it. I mean, just think about the expressions one plus one and two. Two is an integer. That's in memory, that's a pointer to an integer. Uh, one plus one is a pointer to a function plus and uh, po two pointers to two integers. Um, that's gonna take up a lot more memory. And if it's just, um, if it's just one, then, uh, you know, if it's just one thunk that maybe doesn't bother us so much. But when we start to have lots of thunks in memory because everything is lazy, um, you know, we, we need to be conscious about how we make this trade-off. There's not a single solution that's gonna work for, for all cases. Um, so we can't control what we can't measure, we need to measure. And um, my, my controversial statement here that I'll make is, I think that every non-trivial Haskell program leaks thunks. It's leaking memory in terms of, of thunks that, could, that are going to eventually be evaluated anyway. I can justify that if you'll give me a moment. Um, Tom, some question, Lara, is uh, I send you chat. Ah, I see. Um, so if you can stick around for the Q&A, we can do an experiment uh, to show what happens. Um, but it, it's going to take me a couple minutes to set up the experiment, and I don't want to, um, my, my talk time is really tight, so I, I don't want to do this question right now. Is that okay? Sorry about that. Um, quick, quick questions are fine. I, I just, I want to set, I want to, I want to set this example up in GHCI. I don't want to just tell you, I want you to, to believe me. I can give evidence. Um, so there's two my, main types of, um, of profiling that we're going to use. First is cost center profiling. This tells us where our program spends time and where it allocates memory by sections of code or cost centers. Cost centers are frequently, they correspond to functions, but they don't have to. So to turn this on, we need to do two things. First, we need to build our program with profiling. Um, these are a good set of options to do that. Of course, you have to have prof to enable profiling. Um, prof auto top assigns a cost center to every top level definition. So all of our top level functions will be represented in the report automatically. There are different automatic settings you can use, but I think that this one is the, is the good trade-off between um, being detailed versus wasting a lot of time because profiling is slow. And finally, uh, we need to enable RTS settings at runtime. This is off by default because it's potentially insecure, but um, we're not gonna be distributing the program that we build with profiling, so it's not, not gonna be a problem for us. Then we run our program. Um, we use plus RTS to send options to the RTS and just dash P to enable cost center profiling. So here's a little example program. Um, it's got some laziness in it. I didn't really need to, but I defined a lazy type here. Um, so we, we double a small integer and we pass it to this function. This function may or may not print something and then it's gonna return the square lazily, and we're going to print that. So I run, if I run this with cost center profiling, which I've already done, you get a report that looks something like this. Uh, the actual report has a bunch more columns that report other information that isn't interesting here, and I just cut them out to, to make it fit on this slide. Um, it's like stuff like uh, line numbers in the source code, but this is a small program. We can, we can figure it out. Um, so here are the two top level um, entry points of our program. And then you've got the main function and you can see that calls double and small and square. And there's like a stack or a hierarchy of, of call sites here of cost centers. Since this is lazy, we might have some questions. One question might be, where is the function double actually evaluated? Where is the function square actually evaluated? 
We can't actually answer those questions, unfortunately, from the cost center profile because of laziness. So here's a, a quotation from the GHC user guide. I won't read everything to you, but here's the key thing. The cost center stack is independent of the actual evaluation order. So you cannot tell from the cost center profile where a thunk is, um, is going to be evaluated because the cost center stack shows the cost under, the, under where the thunk was created and not where it's evaluated. So cost center profiles can be a little bit tricky to read. Here's another way they're tricky. Recursive calls. If you have a recursive call, all of the recursive calls costs are aggregated in the parent. In other words, a call to a function that occurs elsewhere on the current stack does not push another entry on the stack. Instead, the costs for this call are aggregated into the caller. In other words, if F calls G and G calls F again, the cost center stack is not gonna show F calls G calls F, it's just gonna call F, show F calls G. It will appear that the costs are being misattributed. Now, that's not really true. We just can't tell from the report. When you combine it with laziness, this is another factor that makes cost center stack, uh, cost center reports pretty tricky to interpret correctly. Now that tells us where our program is spending time, but we want, might want to know why our program is taking up so much memory, especially if we're trying to debug like a thunk leak. So to do heap profiling, we need to do all the stuff we did before to build the program with profiling. We just pass different options at runtime. Dash H enables heap profiling, and the dash I option lets us set a different sampling interval. So here I am showing setting the sampling interval to um, 10 milliseconds, 0 0.01 seconds. And that means that at that interval, our program is gonna stop and analyze the heap and see what's on the heap and where, where it was created. So here's a simple program that leaks memory like crazy. Um, this is kind of like the classic bad IORF program. Um, we have an IORF that stores an integer and we're just gonna loop really fast and increment that integer in the IRF. And occasionally, every 100,000 steps or so, we're gonna print out what's in the IRF. And then I added a delay here just to make the whole thing a little bit more readable. So let's see what this looks like. This is kind of the classic thunk leak uh, graph. It's got this sawtooth shape. We allocate memory because we're building up thunks in memory. And then um, suddenly we reclaim a bunch of memory. And that's because evaluation happened. Evaluation happens when we, when we print, okay? Because we have to actually evaluate all those thunks to get a number. The problem, we can actually see the problem is it's in increment, right? Increment is creating all these thunks because it's not actually, we do modify IORF, we are actually uh, updating the number, the integer in the IO ref. We are creating a new thunk. So that is, um, that is kind of the classic bad behavior in a loop. And it looks like this. If you see a heap profile like this, you have got a thunk leak in a loop. I, I guarantee it. Um, there's a question about thunks. How smart is GHC in terms of avoiding thunks unnecessarily? Um, so GHC will not uh, will not evaluate that eagerly. That expression uh, like x equals one plus one. It will not evaluate that eagerly um, unless it can it can tell that you use x somewhere. If it can tell that you use X somewhere, um, it, will, it will do it. It has what's called a demand analyzer or a strictness analyzer, and that's pretty smart. But if it cannot guarantee that you use X somewhere, it won't do that because that would technically change the semantics of your program because plus might be a partial function, or it might not be plus at all, it might be some partial function. Um, in that case, evaluation would give bottom and that would change the semantics of your program if that value were not actually called.
Right, so heap, back to heap profiling for thunks. Limitations, big one, walking the heap is expensive. It's really expensive to do heap profiling and the default sample interval is really long. It's uh, 100 milliseconds. So here's a simple thought experiment. The default sample interval, 100 milliseconds, Nyquist-Shannon theorem means you can't reliably measure spikes that are less than 200 milliseconds. So if your application's response time is less than 200 milliseconds, you won't know if you have space leaks or not. I'm gonna pause here for a moment because I really want that to sink in. Your application, if you run with the default heap profiling settings, you probably can't detect space leaks in say, your web application backend if your response time is under 200 milliseconds. So uh, keep this in mind. Now you say, Tom, just make the sample interval shorter, right? Well, you can do that, but heap analysis is expensive. And if you make it too, make the interval too short, you're going to um, have difficulty running real world workloads in your program, which means you might not trigger the leak or you might trigger it, but it'll be too small to, to detect. So you can do this, you can find the leaks, but it's challenging. The other issue I have with heat profiling is that you lose context. Cost center profiling gives us a nice tree of cost centers, but heat profiling, it's hard to figure out the relationship between things that are being allocated. That means I can find the proximate cause of a, of a leak. Like I can find who, basically who touched this thunk the last, but it's really hard to find the root cause. Like why were we even doing this in the first place? Cause I can't, I can't just go up the tree. It's difficult to figure out. So that brings me to why we should use strict. Um, so this was my experience. This is how I got here. At my last job, my team struggled for months doing performance analysis and debugging space leaks on our uh, large-ish Haskell application, a little over 120,000 lines of code. And we found, some, we found and fixed some issues, but we really still felt like we had just barely scratched the surface. So in anger, I advocated for switching to strict Haskell. Um, the switch was actually pretty, pretty painless. It just took a little bit of time. Um, and within about a week of, of dealing with performance issues after we had made the switch, we had fixed more performance bugs than we had found previously. Um, and we were really happy about that. And we really finally felt like we had control of our biggest performance concerns. There are basically two ways that we found that uh, strict helps us control performance. The first is that strict tends to make fewer thunks. That trades time for space. Remember I said there's a trade-off. Making thunks takes up more space, but save time. Strict, strict by default, tends to turn the dial the other way. So your program will usually waste time instead of leaking space. But cost center profiling is pretty good. It's a lot, it's pretty, it's much easier to, to debug a program that wastes time compared to a program that wastes space. The other way it helps is that strict tends to make the cost center profile and the actual evaluation order match better. Like I said, the, the cost center profile doesn't show the true evaluation order but when strict is on, they tend to line up a little bit better. So here's how we made the switch to strict. The first thing is you're gonna need some kind of end-to-end -end performance measurement. We're not looking, we're just looking to find performance regressions, okay? So we don't need to do detailed analysis, just something like the time command is good enough to see if suddenly your program takes more time or uses more memory. And this is no problem, because you've all already got end-to-end -end benchmarks of your application, right? Or at least end-to-end -end tests. So maybe that's the first thing that we need to do is have end-to-end -end tests, okay? And we can time them and we can catch some regressions that way. You can also do micro benchmarking, um, but for laziness issues, I find that tends not to be very useful because the problems arise from complex interactions between many different parts of the program and micro benchmarks often don't catch that, I think. 
Then to actually make the switch, we turn on strict in one module, run the benchmarks. If there's a regression, fix it and repeat that. Um, debugging problems can sometimes take a little bit of time because since they're based on interactions between components, the problems are gonna be like non-local. So this can be a little bit tedious in a large project and why I would advocate for starting with strict in the first place on a new project, but you can do it. We did it, um, this is an achievable thing. Then once you've done that, I would add strict to my default extensions in my uh, package file. Um, and from then on, I don't need it in the individual modules. So that, that worked um, for us. With about 120,000 lines of code, I think it took us, um, I think it took one person about a week to go through all the modules and make these changes. Um, so it's time consuming, but it's not impossible. One problem that we ran into a couple times that I wanna tell you about, because I've got a solution. Um, if you find a type that's expensive to compute, but you don't need it very often, it should be bound lazily by default. In other words, we wanna put a tilde everywhere, but it's kind of hard to remember to use that tilde. So we introduce a lazy wrapper for it. And then, oh, the type system reflects which arguments of our functions are strict and lazy. They're strict by default. And then when you see, um, when you have the lazy here, then they're lazy. Oh, uh, there's a question in chat. Do I think that debugging time issues is fundamentally easier than debugging space issues? I do think it is fundamentally um, easier and I'll tell you why. The time issues are fundamentally hierarchical. Um, Space problems tend to be non-local, but time problems are usually localizable. And local problems are easier to debug. So um, our tools could be better too, but I think there's a fundamental issue here. Um, I'm starting to run out of time, so I'm just gonna breeze through this real quick, but suffice it to say that derive functor does not behave nicely with strict. It writes instances that are technically incorrect. Actually, derive functor doesn't behave well with strict data or with strict fields. So keep that in mind. I do want to pause here though. A common complaint about strict is that it breaks substitution with bottom. If I have let, this let is going to make x strict, right? So these two expressions, even though they appear to be the same, are actually only the same if f of y is well-defined or if g is strict. Do we care? I think we don't. I base this, this is an empirical determination I've made. First of all, most people, when they do equational reasoning, most people that I know anyway, they kind of implicitly assume that everything is well-defined. They don't think about bottom at all. Second, if we really did care how our code handled bottom, handled undefined input, we would write tests for that. I've never written a test like that, and I don't know anyone else who has either. I've never seen a test written like that. We can go do it, but I've never seen anyone do it. So I can only conclude that people don't actually care about the difference between these two expressions, which is very subtle anyway. Why not? Well, here's a quote from the paper, fast and loose reasoning is morally correct. I've got the DOI there if you wanna read it. Functional programmers often reason about programs as if they were written in a total language, expecting the results to carry over to partial languages. It is proved that if two closed terms have the same semantics in the total language, they have related semantics in the partial language. In other words, your program uh, in a partial language, if you, if you don't really care about where bottoms are, the programs will be related anyway, if you're not careful. And most of us, we work in domains with models where bottom doesn't mean anything, right? If I pull someone, if, my, if I'm working on a social media website and I pull someone's social media profile out of a database, for example, there are no bottoms in that data. There's no bottoms in the database. That's something that just kind of exists in, in the Haskell world. So it's not something that I'm thinking about anyway. It's not part of the model of my domain. And I don't really care. Looking forward to the future, um, you know, with strict, we are still being a little bit imprecise with bottoms. I acknowledge that. Um, I look forward in the future to when we can be totally precise. So normal data types allow bottom. They're called lifted types. Uh, and right now in GHC, we have primitive types, which are um, unlifted. So in the future, um, there's a proposal to add user-defined unlifted data types to GHC. So we would be allowed to define types for GHC that don't allow bottom, basically strict types. That would be great, okay? In a few years, like maybe 
five, 10 years, I hope to give another version of this talk. It's a, it'll be a lightning talk, a single slide. You'll say, if bottom means something in your domain model, like you're working in the abstract theory of computations or something, use a lifted data type. And for everyone else, just use unlifted data and save yourself some headaches. So my, in conclusion, my recommendations, start measuring performance of your application now when it's small. Everyone says, I don't care about performance, but then one day they wake up and it's too slow and suddenly they care, care now. Do more measurements and do better measurements. I think your Haskell programs probably leak memory in ways that you aren't testing for. So be aware of that. Finally, my most controversial recommendation probably, use strict to make it easier to debug the problems that you do measure. Helped me, made me and my team happier. I think it could work for you too. Thank you very much.